This is the Brandon and Brandon panel, so let's introduce first our wonderful guests, Brandon Sanderson and Brandon Mull. I don't know where you guys, we can't see a thing. These lights are super bright, but um, I appreciate y'all coming out to see us in the big room. Ooh. Yeah, we can try to hear our echoes. Hello! Okay, <laughs> so um, how many of you have read a book written by someone named Brandon? Doesn't have to be these two. That is fantastic. So I'm going to assume they don't need a lot of introduction, right? We know who they are, but I would like to start, before I force them into doing horrible things, um, I would like them to start just by telling us what they have that's new that they need to check out, and what cool future things are they working on. Uh, let's start with Brandon Ball. Okay, so um, I've been doing a sequel series to my Fable Haven series. That is, it's called Dragon Watch. Fable Haven was a, f a five book series, and it was my first series. A brother and sister discovering that their grandpa is the caretaker of a secret wildlife park for magical creatures. Um, and when I finished it in 2010, I thought I was out of gas and didn't expect to go back there. But I, I realized probably the coolest part of that story happened at the Dragon Sanctuary in book four. And, uh, as I thought about it, I realized there was an opportunity there to make some new stories. So, Dragon Watch happens primarily at the Dragon Sanctuaries in the Fable Haven world. Um, and it'll be a five book series. We have two books out so far. Book three is what I'm working on, like minute to minute right now, because it's due really soon. It'll come out in October. And it'll be cool. And it's not done yet. Well, it's not done yet. You know, it's called, I think it's going to be called Master of the Phantom Isle. And, and uh, yeah, it's not done yet, and I'm stressed. <laughs> But not as stressed as my publisher. <laughs> That's how it always goes. Um, I am, uh, I, my newest book is called Skyward. It is a uh, uh, young adult science fiction sequel is done and turned in. <laughs> uh, comes out in December. I am currently writing um, the fourth book of the Stormlight Arc. I'm about 5%. Website. I actually pick it up every time I finish a chunk, I, I increase the percentage. That 5% is actually 230 pages, so... <laughs> um, how many of you, uh, Brandon Sanders and fans, have heard him talk about uh, the Apocalypse Guard? Is that something? Awesome. That, that is one that he and I are working on together, and is in its, what, fourth revision draft at this point? We keep changing things. We keep changing it everything. It keeps getting weirder. In our last conversation, we're like, the ending's not working. How should we fix it? Let's uproot the entire magic system and rebuild the world. So that's where we are right now. Um, all right, so I told you I was going to make them do horrible things, right? It's not really horrible. Like, I'm not going to make them dance or whatever. Well, I want to, but do you want them to dance? Every crowd wants anyone to dance. <laughs> That's just how it works. You know, I've never heard a crowd say, no, we're good. Because if you're in a crowd, you're just glad it's not you. You're like, yeah, make him dance. <laughs> you know. Okay, what I want to do, we're going to do a cool thing here. I'm going to make them pitch us some movies. Okay? But first, I need to hear from you all some of your favorite movies. Okay? So can somebody just shout one out? Can you 
please describe for us the second movie in that trilogy that links them in an entirely reasonable and compelling way? Okay, this is going to be extra hard because I haven't seen The Martian. Oh. What? I haven't seen The Martian. It's about a guy stranded on Mars. Oh, what was that one? Yeah. Is it Matt Damon on Mars? Yeah. Yeah, I have seen it. <laughs> I was picturing something he thought else. thought it was like a Damon panic room. No, no, okay, yeah, so what happens? Yeah, so the, on the Martian, so you've got Matt Damon, and towards the end of the movie, he builds this really, like, elaborate thing that when you, like, knock on his door, it makes his bowling ball roll, and then, like, it hits into a thing, and it pivots around, and, like, like, a, like leading toward a truffle shuffle kind of something, right? And, and that somehow slingshots him. Man, these are two really far apart stories. Um, but he, uh, he, he, he gets his way back to Earth, and a bunch of, no, no, okay, here it is. So he's on Mars, he runs into a ragtag bunch of kids. <laughs> Just totally unexpected, right? Because he thought he was alone. <laughs> and, and this ragtag bunch of kids, they're all misfits, and they, they, they need to, they're trying to, they're trying to save, now that's becoming straight goonies. Um, <laughs> But the ragtag, which again, they build a ship, and it's got a sweet force field, and it gets him back to Earth that way. And so they can find pirates. It's really hard. It's really hard. This is not what I do for a living, is bridge these two movies. Like, he says that's not it. That's totally it. Um, now this is the absolutely unfair part of the show. When I say, Brandon, you've had more time to think about it. Pitch me a better version of that, that middle movie. <laughs> Just three coherent sentences and you'll have done it. So when you, it's, it's actually kind of hard, like the bridging part, because when you say those two things, my mind starts to go into a lot of the way that I construct stories is, here's something I love from this, here's something I love from this. Let's distill it down, boil it down to what I love about it. What did I love about The Martian? The Martian was a person with uh, very few resources, but a lot of intelligence and um, capacity put into a really difficult situation where he could receive no help from out, out the outside world, and he was able to work against all these difficulties to, to survive. That is a really cool arc on its own. Uh, what did I like about the Goonies? The thing I like about the Goonies is this group of kids who are misfits, um, who have banded together and kind of how their misfit nature plays off of each other to accomplish something that nobody thought they could do. So actually the structure of these two things shares that kind of parallel element of taking what you have, putting it together, um, and, you know, without external help and achieving something. And so I would try to do a story that is about um, a, you know, we, a, in the science fiction world, we're going on a, um, a field trip. And on the field trip in the science fiction world, you get on this ship and it takes you to these very pristine, terrible planets. But you know, you're safe, you're in a bubble. It's kind of like, you know, you wouldn't want to be here. This is the wild lands. This is, the, this is you know, this planet. We're gonna go view this one. But of course, they crash. Um, you know, the, all, all, the, all the parents, all the adults, all the teachers are dead. And it's a group of kids, yeah, trapped on an alien world um, full of deadly monsters that want to eat them. Um, and them using their wreckage and what's left in it to build something that will keep them alive long enough to get off. And that's the story I'm right? You see what I said about how when you have more time to think about it, it works way better. Okay, this time we're going to be going to the end your mind is a supercomputer. <laughs> the second one on this next one, okay? It's going to be amazing. And we're going to follow that same kind of idea that, that Brandon... I can't... I'm going to give you just one and two. Can I call you just thing one and thing, thing two? One and thing two? Yeah. Sure. Who's one? Who's two? You can decide. He's nearer, so he's one. Okay. okay. <laughs> thing one. Um, what I want you to do, you're pitching a movie to a producer, okay? All right. And they say, you know what's really big these days is... Uh, is kids are, you know, Moana was a really big deal, but we want to darken it up a little, so can you please give us a movie that is Moana meets Breaking Bad? <laughs> okay? Oh, man. The Gritty Reboot. Yeah. Moana. So, pitch, pitch me that movie. All right, all right. Um, so what is really cool about Breaking Bad? What's really cool about Breaking Bad is a person who thought they were good, 
put in a really desperate situation and trying to do something good for the wrong reasons, right? Or for the, for the right reasons, wrong methods. Um, extreme situation, I'm, the system has, has screwed me over and I'm going to take that and I'm just going to create something wonderful for my family and consequences, who cares? And of course, that corrupts him. And that's the story, is you can't do evil things even for good, a good purpose without it rubbing off on you and destroying you. Um, and if you distill that story down to its core, that's what makes it work. What makes Moana work? <laughs> okay, um, what makes Moana work, and why I really in enjoyed that movie, um, is I really liked the, the sort of elemental aspect of it. I liked uh, person versus nature, where nature was a, was a character and was trying to teach her something. The ocean was alive, but the ocean was also very, very dangerous. Um, and so if I'm going to, I'm going to combine those two, I'm going to go to an island, I'm going to go to kind of a, a fantastical island culture, and I'm going to put some sort of fantastical element into it, a magic system that is really dangerous to be involved in. Very, very dangerous. In fact, it will corrupt you over time and turn you into a giant fire monster that will destroy your family, right? Um, but, but... Um, meth is a terrible drug. Meth is a terrible drug. But, um, this society has an external pressure. Something, you know, like there's an, there's an invader coming in. Um, probably ought to make it elemental as well. There's something coming out of the ocean, something terrible. Something that's going to destroy everything. And so, our main character, our protagonist, takes that step to bind this magic that is really dangerous, knowing that once she's bound this magic, she had better, you know, sacri she better die before it takes her over. She fights off the, um, the evil, but then she has the ring, right? She has the ring of power. She has the thing that's corrupting her and changing her. And over time, we see her rise to be the queen of the islands, conquering all of them, um, and not able to let go of that power um, until it ends up destroying everything she loves. Not bad. Disney next summer. Um, Brandon Hall, give me an even better version of that same story. Moana meets Breaking Bad. Okay, so there's this uh, guy with hair <laughs> at first, and he uh, he starts he starts looking wistfully into drug dealer's lair. They start saying like, I am gone to make some drugs, and I am gone to make some bad I am gone to make some ball, and I am something like that. Or, should we make Brandon Sanderson dance while Brandon Hill sings that song? You guys, you guys see Hitch, I live right here. <laughs> so, that's, that's as wild as I get. So you can go down that road where you added music, right? To, to You're turning it to a musical, that's great. To break Breaking Bad the musical. Breaking Bad the musical, yeah. You add some music, you get the Matt Will Miranda to write some heartfelt stuff. Or you can have this little Hawaiian girl and this really bizarre, drugged out thing like becomes her friend and you'd have a movie that's already been made, which is Lilo and Stitch. <laughs> that's all that is a hybrid of Breaking Bad. Want it in some ways, maybe. Yeah. That's cool. That's all I got. That's great. Short, but kind of funny. Now, which one of the two of them will write that book first? Is I guess the question that I have now. Um, did you just say Brandon? That is not a good answer to that question. Brandon, the right answer is a correct answer to the question. <laughs> the right that answer is Sanderson will write it first because yeah, he's he's an efficient machine for turning out text. He knows how to get it written. I would turn it into a 12-book series, and it would be done in 20 years. That's true. That's the best part. That's true. It would have been on tour seven times by the time I'm getting to the third book. That is possible. Yeah, it wouldn't, it wouldn't swell yeah, to 12 books, I think, for me. I love it. Um, I'm going to ask them some more questions about what is, uh, what's going on with their lives. But first, I want to give you guys a chance to start lining up. We have... I know there's a microphone right here. Is that our only question microphone? It looks like it's probably... No? Is there a microphone over there? I don't know. I just got waved at. Maybe it's just a very friendly person. Hi! No, there's already a line? 
Okay, so then just form a line over there. Okay, so this is how we're going to do this. I'm not asking for questions yet, so you just get to stand in the spotlight for a while. But if you have questions you want to ask them, form a line over there, and then when summoned, we will bring you into the middle. Uh, okay, but first, I wanted to ask um, if there is anything you're allowed to tell us, either one of you, about some adaptation deals that any of you, that either of you are working on, are we able to look forward in the future to some comic books, some movies, some TV series, some soft drinks, some breakfast cereals? What have you got going on that you're allowed to talk about? Cosmere the flamethrower. Uh, <laughs> um, uh, the thing I'm allowed to talk about, I've actually got permission on this. Uh, I've read the first two scripts of the Wheel of Time television show. <laughs> I really like the showrunner on the Wheel of Time show. His name is Rafe. Um, he's actually from Salt Lake City. Um, and he, um, he is really sharp. He loves the series. And one of the first things he did when he got in charge of me was reach out to me, which I, I really appreciated. Um, and he has brought me into the offices, introduced me to the all the writers, uh, shown me what they're doing, given me their major, their plot outline, and given me the first two episodes to read. And they're really good. Um, I'm very pleased with how it's going. So I, I think it's actually not only going to happen, it's going to happen well. Um, and I'm really excited by it. So theoretically, I'm going to read all the scripts uh, for, the, for the first season to give my feedback. And uh, he's already been listening to things I said and sent revisions based on what I said. So he's listening. <laughs> They say later this year, with uh, sometime next year's release, they'll, it's um, um, it's one of these you know digital first things, so it'll be the whole season put out at once, so you can binge on it. Thing two, do you have anything to talk about? I mean, here's the thing: like um, Fablehaven has been in development for a long, long time. It's happened over and over. There's currently like a team of guys who wrote a good screenplay. And there's a big producer who's interested. And, and like I've just learned not to get super excited, so I, 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 I'm not getting super specific. But like, uh, but yeah, there's something kind of exciting going on. The screenplay they wrote is really good. I read that; it's cool. And, and I, I am super aware that if I hold my breath, I will suffocate waiting for this to happen. So I, I don't hold my breath, but uh, you know, I'm optimistic that someday there'll be something cool. We'll see. Cool. That's awesome. All right, it is question time. The way we're gonna do this is ask your question and then return to your seat so someone else can come up while they're answering it, and please. Hi, um, my question is, how did you guys get published the very first time? So like, what was that process like for each of you? Thank you, by the way, that is a model of how to ask a question. It started with a question word, not a comment, and it was fantastic, thank you very much. <laughs> Um, so, I got published by going to conventions. Um, Dan and I took a class together at BYU that David Farland taught. Um, he's a fantasy novelist, and we met in that class, uh, started a writing group together, and one of the things Dave told us was, hey, you should go network, you should go meet people. Uh, you're starting with, as a writer, writing a book, you are basically trying to start a small business. Um, you don't write generally for people, you are a business owner who is licensing. Um, to publishers and things, and so you get to, got to know all the places that could buy your work. Um, and so we started flying around to, uh, to conventions, uh, specifically the ones focused on publishing. Things like World Fantasy Convention and World Con and the Nebula Wars, and places where a lot of editors and agents hang out, just to try to network and to figure out the business. Um, and we went to those for three years or so, four years or so, um, and eventually, at a, a, in Montreal, Dan ran into an editor at Tor, which is a publisher we were both interested in, and Dan came running up to me and said, I found this guy, uh, his name is Motion Fader, you gotta come talk to him, he sounds perfect. Uh, we'd, we'd heard his name mentioned before earlier in the con, so we both went over and he talked our ears off for like two hours, and he eventually bought books from both of us. That's how we broke in. Cool. For me it was, uh, I tried kind of blindly submitting stuff for a long time as a young writer, and, and just never got anything back. And then I, uh, I, uh, it, was, it was just something that I really, really loved, and so I, I finally wrote a novel. And, and when I wrote that novel, I shopped it around every place I knew and had no success with it. I had no idea of how, of how to even begin to try to start networking or something. Um, and I kind of thought maybe it wouldn't work out, 
but I, but I sort of just hung in there and <laughs> prayed a lot, and uh, I finally landed in a place called Shadow Mountain, that manuscript. Um, I, I got hired to work writing marketing stuff for a company called Excel Entertainment, and, and there was a connection there, someone knew somebody, they put it in front of an editor's, an editor, and they, they liked how I wrote that first book I wrote. And they didn't, they didn't buy that, but the, the next book I wrote was Fablehaven. And, and I, showed, I showed them Fablehaven, and because I had that relationship with the editor, they, I don't know what Fablehaven would have done, because it sold the first place I showed it, which was at Shadow Mountain, which is a fairly, you know, a mid-sized publisher here in, here in Utah, um, and that is how my career got started. It was a huge relief. Almost every writer I know, it's, it's almost like a different kind of little windy road. It's like there's like always the exact same way, but the, the destination is finally somebody who likes and gets what you wrote, <laughs> finds it and wants to buy it. And that could be hard to make that happen. Cool, thank you. All right, next question. Hello, Hello. Um, my question is for Branderson. Um, <laughs> Uh, so, you had had a word of Brandon that had said that Tien was on his way to becoming a light weaver. Um, and my question is, did he ever actually become a light weaver? Did he speak an oath? And if so, did he bond with a cryptic? Um, that's an excellent question. So, um, if you look closely through the, the first book, you will see Tien having some slight light weaving effects. Um, in the back of my head, he was where Kaladin was through most of the first book, where it wasn't really official, um, but there was a spread hanging around, um, and he was very close to, by the time he left, already have done that. Um, I would say that he never actually managed to get that bond working, um, and uh, that uh, otherwise perhaps things would have played out differently as they, than they did. Cool, thank you. What's the most important process in the world? What's the most important part of your world building, world building process? Most important part of my process, um, you know, like for me, it's 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 letting it cook for a while. Like like so, I'll come up with a premise, and maybe like I came up with the premise of secret wildlife parks for magical creatures as an example from Fablehaven, right? And and I will come up with lots and lots of different premises for different worlds where I can tell a story. And I let it, I let it cook in my head. And it, letting it cook in my head means I, I, I daydream about it. And I see if over time it becomes more fun or if it becomes less fun. Like, like it's thin and boring to me or if it gets richer and richer the more I think about it. Um, with Fablehaven, I started asking myself what kind of creatures would live at this wildlife park and who'd want to help them and who'd want to harm them. And what kind of secrets might they know? And what, what kind of treasures might they guard? And how long have they been there? And are there different kinds of wildlife parks for different kinds of creatures? And the more I thought about it, the more it became a playground in my head. And as it became a playground in my head, um, and it had lots of details attached to it, I, I started thinking, oh, this is really a fun place to go. Maybe readers would want to go here. And so um, I would say thinking about the world that you're building long enough that you flush it out, like long enough that details settle in. And, and hopefully, over time, having it feel cooler to you, and, you know, in a, in a way that excites you and makes you want to invite people to visit that place. You know, this is a really interesting way to phrase it, the most important part, right? That's, you know, um, and I like that phrase because uh, what is the most important part? Uh, the most fun for me is what uh, Mold was talking about, that initial idea, letting it germinate. Um, maybe my first kind of scribbling down ideas on a page there is an outline. That's the most fun. The most important part is probably where I sit down to write that first chapter to see if I can make it happen in a way that's going to be evocative, have cool imagery, and be exciting, as opposed to something that's going to be boring, require lots of explanation, and read like an encyclopedia. And sometimes I sit down to write an idea out and I realize this idea um, it's cool to me because I have this certain foundation, but when I start writing it, I have to go into so much depth to make it cool on the page that it gets really boring really fast. Or you try something and you're like, that is not nearly as cool as it sounded to me uh, when, I, when I was thinking about this um, or scribbling down these ideas. Um, and this happens to me quite a bit where I just sit down and try it out and I'm like, wow, that magic just does not actually work on the page. Um, so I'd say the most important part is the first chapter um, for the world building. Awesome, thank you. Hi, um, so do people ever mix you two up? And how do you handle that? And do you like to mess with their minds a little bit? 
Okay, I, I, gotta, I gotta jump on this one because um, I grew up in Nebraska, and um, in Nebraska, I always thought my name was really unique. I had never met another Brandon, right? I grew up through, there was not another Brandon in my high school. Um, I'm like, this is a really, I wonder where my parents got this name. Well, you know, they're both LDS. I came out to go to BYU freshman year, and there were three Brandons in my freshman dorm hall. And I realized that this was a regional name that my parents had, um, you know, this, this happens, different names kind of move through different regions or whatever. They grew up um, in, in Idaho. Brandon was a name that's much more common out here. So here I thought I had this really unique name. I come out here, and there's Brandons on every street corner, right? You know, and everyone's got plenty of Brandons. And then I get published, and I'm not even the first Brandon fantasy novelist in Utah, um, let alone the first Brandon fantasy novelist. And so um, it does, particularly when I was brand new, nobody knew who I was, I would have really excited kids show up in my, my very short lines of like one person. They come up and be like, I brought your book. And I'm like, yes, someone showed up. And then it's a Fablehaven book. Um, and um, I will admit a couple of times, I'm just like, they look so excited. Here you go, kid. Um, Which I fully endorse. Yeah. That's awesome. We, we talk to each other about that. Um, most of the time I say, uh, you know, this is actually the other Brandon. Um, there's two of us, but I'll sign your book anyway, and then you can show it to him. And I'll usually write something silly in it. Um, not usually as silly as the things um, Mole will write in the books that I see come through. Um, uh, Mole has a background as a stand-up uh, com uh, improv comedy troupe, and he would write, oh, it wasn't improv, it was uh, sketch comedy, wasn't it? That's right, yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. yeah and he, so he will write these, these jokey lines in the book sometimes. Often it's things like, this is the best book I've ever written. <laughs> <You know? laughs> yeah, just take full credit. Because <laughs> I'm like, man, this thing's thick, it's got to be good. You know? <laughs> it's like my whole series right here. <laughs> no, but, but to, me, to me, it's always a compliment if I get confused with Brandon ever. And uh, from time to time, people on purpose bring me the wrong book. And yeah, this think, happens a lot now. Yeah, yeah, just being silly, they'll bring me the wrong book sometimes. People do this a lot with me with Rothfuss. Do they? Um, yeah, because they, they heard, like, Rothfuss occasionally goes, and I, I told him, um, so the, the Salt Lake Airport has a really nice bookstore in the airport with some good booksellers who hand sell a lot of books, and so I sign my books regularly when I stop through the airport, um, and I told Rothfuss, I'm like, you need to stop at airports and sign books particularly if you come through Salt Lake. I know you do that a lot because it's a hub. Um, and so he flew through Salt Lake and he signed my books. Because <laughs> I had told him he had to sign the books. He's like, there, I did it. Um, and so people thought that was hilarious. Don't do this a ton. Um, but the thing about his books, about Rothfuss's books, is his titles, uh, The Name of the Wind and The Wise Man's Fear, lend themselves really, really well to being edited. So I can say the name of the wind, it says the name of the wind, and I can write is Bob. Um, it, or the wise man's fear is cheese that sat in the rain out too long, or something like that. And it works really well. Yours don't work that very, that well. It's like Dragon Watch. I can't add anything to that, or, you know. You've got like a picture of like a watch that's a dragon. Yeah, that's kind of like uh, I should sell dragon watches. Like that would be. What do you think? Watch manufacturers in the house. Like, come, come talk to me if you want to lose a lot of money. <laughs> All right. Um, how do you all feel about fan fiction? Not necessarily of your works, but as a general practice and community. You know, I'll, I'll say this. I'll say that um, I, when I was young, there, I, I, if, if there was fan fiction, I didn't know about it. Right. But but my but my storytelling engine partly got developed by daydreaming about Narnia because I like the Narnia books, and so I would daydream adventures, and so I would sort of write fan fiction in my mind, and I would turn it into stories. I would tell my little brothers and sisters, even sometimes kids in the neighborhood, I'd make up Narnia adventures with us in it, right? And basically, that was oral fan fiction, right? I was I was making up stories, and so for me, in that way, Narnia was useful. Um, for me personally, on my books, I, I wouldn't read my fan fiction because I don't. If anyone like did fan fiction of Fable, either, I wouldn't read that because I wouldn't want to like start picturing my characters the way someone else pictured it, right? But like, I don't know. As long as it, as long as you're not like publishing it and making money off it, um, like if you're using it as practice and fun, and to me that seems okay. But I, I don't know. What do you think about it? Um, <clears throat> so I am. Uh, I think fan fiction is a great thing. 
Um, it's because I go to a lot of cons, a lot of um, science fiction cons, a lot of literary cons. I didn't kind of come up through the fan fiction community, but I know a lot of people who that was a big part of their uh, writing experience, part of their, their life, part of their fandom life was participating in that. And I saw all the good things it did for them. So I always have a very kind of liberal perspective on fan fiction. I think it does good things uh, for the community. I have never written it. Um, like, well, I grew up in a, the pre internet era, and in the pre internet era, finding any fan fake or things like that um, was not, it, the communities weren't the same back then. Um, though, <clears throat> like all the first books, were basically fan fiction. That's what. That's usually how you start, right? Um, like my very first book is basically a half uh, Dragonlance, um, half uh, Tad Williams crossover fanfic. Um, and this is just, you know, I think it is a good way to to ease into writing if uh, if it appeals to you. I am dying to know if you suddenly had the time and the desire to write some fanfic right now. What property would it be? I just did one, right? No, you, uh, you know about this. I do, yes. Um, because Wizards of the Coast, I play Magic the Gathering. Um, they came to me and uh, said, hey, would you write a story for us? And I said, N no, I'm not going to write your story, but I actually have already plotted a story in your universe, and I'm just going to write that, and you can have it. Um, and they're like, oh, okay. So I just wrote it and gave it to them, and they put it for free on their website. So if you like, like Magic the Gathering, I, I did a story for them, and it really came about because I had already plotted a story that I would write in the um, Magic the Gathering, one of their worlds, if I ever had the chance. Um, so I was right there, ready, ready, to, ready to, to go. Awesome. How about you? I mean, if I was going to mess around someplace, like, I don't know, like, my inner little kid would like to mess around in Star Wars. That would be kind of fun. Uh, Sweet. All right. How do you guys go about creating lingual choices and linguistic differences in your writing and cultures? Um, I got two um, basic uh, things you could go on that are... Um, I guess there's three. The third one, though, is the really hard one. This is where you take some linguistics classes and start to actually learn how linguistics works. This is great if you're already interested in it, but um, I find that the way to be a really great fantasy writer is to know a little bit about a lot of things and try and incorporate that all together. You don't have to go become a philologist like Professor Tolkien and become a linguist and things like this. Um, a couple of suggestions. Um, one is I, I, I like the idea of picking a region in your fantasy world that kind of um, has some similar linguistics to something in our world. And trying to, you know, go look at baby names for a language you don't speak. Go look at us. Uh, uh, atlases for those, and see if you can pick out similarities to how some of this works. Learn a little bit of basic linguistics about how morphemes work, and which sounds are um, would, will, will appear in a language and which ones won't. Find the list and say, okay, these are sounds that don't appear in French, or that do appear in French that don't appear in English. Start building some linguistics, some, um, some words of your own based on that, and be like, this region, I'm just going to follow those rules. Um, it can be a very easy way to kind of start to ease yourself into linguistics. The other thing that I do is I pick some sort of weird linguistic um, archetype that is not based on something in our world. This will be like repeated consonant sounds, or it'll be words that are symmetrical, names that are symmetrical, things like this that have a kind of mythological import to the place that, uh, that I'm writing in. I'm like, I'm going to use this as a thing so the reader can quickly see on the page, they see this thing, they'll be like, you know what, this is probably an Alethi name because of the, the symmetry that it has. Um, these sorts of things are kind of some easy sort of methods to, um, to do some naming and coming up with um, linguistic if you're not going to build a whole language. I'm going to let that stand. <laughs> right. Awesome, thank you. Okay, we are running low. We have like two minutes left, so this will be our last question. Sorry to all of you over there. You're my favorites and I love you. Um, yes. All right, this question is for both of you. Um, so how do you come up with your uh, magic systems? Do you think about the consequences of using magic and how it could go wrong and other logistics like that? It's a good question. Um, I'll, I'll hit a little bit and then you hit a little bit. Um, so, a, a beautiful thing about a fantasy story is we can build the world and build the magic to serve the story, right? To kind of, to kind of, to kind of help we can build reality around what we're trying to achieve with our storytelling a little bit, right? Uh, and especially if we kind of plan ahead and see what's coming. And so when I think about my magic, I'm often 
I'm often trying to think about how will this um, both limit um, the character in some ways and, and enhance the, my ability to tell the story I'm trying to tell, right? And so, obviously, I make it too powerful, it breaks the story, right? OP, overpowered. And, and, and if I, but, but, but I'm always looking for magic that will, uh, that will let me tell a different kind of story, like maybe to get a little specific, like, I mean, people call the Mark of All of My Beyonders books, right? These guys had seeds at the base of their skull, you plant the seed, they could regrow and live again. So my question becomes, if you could, you know, plant the seed, regrow and live again, why tell a story with this in it? Like, what, 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 is, what unique story can I tell with these people? And like, one example would be there was one guy who was on his last life, his last seed. Person who had near, they could be nearly immortal, but this was his last seed. That's a story I can only tell with those people, and so that was a, a fun thing to include in my Beyonders books. Um, so, I probably, there's too much to dig into right now. I'm gonna point you toward the internet. Go Google something called Sanderson's Laws. Um, they are four essays I've written that are the rules that I try to follow myself for building magicisms the way I like to build them. Awesome, thank you very much. Uh, we are now out of time. Sanderson's Law, this could be like a good sitcom too or something. Uh, Sanderson's Law, yeah. Like our long, our long dramedy. <laughs> Brandon and Brandon, attorneys at law. Uh, so being out of time, as we learned from the last panel, is the moment in the show where we bring you all up to do karaoke, I think. <laughs> no, they do need us to be gone. So let's get a big round of applause for Brandon and Brandon. You just go back in time, two and a half hours. Other than that, you will never sign up for a I'm a local guy, you can find me at a bookstore somewhere. Sweet. Yeah. Awesome. Thank you all for coming. You're beautiful. Nice to see you.